everyone, and welcome to the next episode of DSCI Insights in Action. I have two great distinguished guests with me today to cover the topic of the ESG research Digital Supply Chain Institute did recently. And those are the insights which can take you to the next level of uh, comprehension what's going on in supply chain. With me today, I have a privilege to have Marissa Brown, Senior Principal Le Research Lead, Supply Chain Management from APQC. Marisa, welcome. Thank you, Marco. And I have my dear colleague, Craig Moss, who is the Director uh, of Data and Change Management from Digital Supply Chain Institute. Welcome, Craig. Great to be here, Marco. Great to be with you also, Marissa. Thank you, Craig. Looking forward to it. So I know you have been cooking a lot, you know, in, in your special kitchen related to applied research and the Digital Supply Chain Institute is particularly proud uh, of the partnership we have built with APQC. So Marisa, let, let's start the conversation together with you and Craig as a fireside chat so it can be more interesting for everybody. But I would like to start uh, uh, from you uh, focusing on one thing. What are some of the most significant findings from the survey regarding the current stage of uh, ESG integration in supply chain. There has been a lot of conversation around it, plans, strategies, but integration is something not that many people speak about. It's true, it's true. So I think when I look at the findings from this research, some of them were reaffirming and some of them were a little bit concerning. And um, I think it was reaffirming to see that ESG factors are widely considered as an important part of supply chain. But on the concerning side, we saw a pretty big gap. And um, Craig, you were one of the first to notice it between the value that organizations are placing on ESG and their actual integration of those principles into their core strategy and operations. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, I often say to companies, it's easier to say something than to do something. So what, what I see a lot of is companies are reacting to pressure from regulators, they're reacting to pressure from customers, but, and they're saying, yeah, we need to do something, but they're not quite at the point where they've integrated the action into their strategy mm -hmm. um, and made it operational. So it's it's really very insightful, especially understanding that the pressure now is coming from various different sides. It comes from the regulator. It comes from uh, the actually end buyer, and you know it comes from the overall uh, understanding and you know care about the planet. So having these in mind, were there any surprising insights or uh, unexpected trend re revealed, you know, by the survey data you had related to supply chain management? Marisa, oh, we can start with you. Sure. I'll share two things that kind of I thought were interesting when we looked at the data by region and then also comparing manufacturing with services organizations. So one of the questions that we were looking for answers to is what specific goals related to ESG have organizations already implemented? And when we looked at it across the board, we saw some significant similarities. But when we delve down into region, for example, both Europe and the Americas put ethical business practices at the top. But in Africa and Middle East, it was social inclusion and diversity. And then for Asia Pac, it was waste reduction and recycling. So seeing the differences by region was really kind of interesting. Um, and then when we look at it by manufacturing versus services, I thought that it wasn't surprising, but it was again like reaffirming to see that manufacturing is ahead when it comes to goals related to waste reduction, recycling, emissions reduction, water conservation, that kind of thing, versus services where there was much more of a focus on the social inclusion and diversity and those ethical business practices. Yeah, I think a couple of things jumped out to me, uh, Marco. One of the things that jumped out to me was that companies are not consistently using it in how they select suppliers. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about that, it, whether it's an environmental issue like carbon in the uh, carbon footprint, or it's a human rights in the supply chain issue, companies 
have to take into consideration what their suppliers are doing in order for them to meet their own ESG goals. Mm -hmm. Related to that, what we saw is a lot of companies are using ESG criteria in supplier selection a little bit, but not consistently. So that to me means that kind of gets back to the lack of integration into overall strategy and operation. So that was one thing that jumped out to me quite a bit. The other thing was, and I'm going to go back to like the the drivers, what's driving it. Um, We heard consistently that it was really customers and regulations that are the top two drivers with investors being number three in the list. If we think about that, it also points to the fact that it really are economic issues that are driving the behavior. So it's not that companies are doing it because they think it's better for the environment. They're doing it because they think it's going to be better for their business, which personally I think is a great thing because we want to integrate those issues, that thinking into how a company's strategy operates. So they're not thinking of it as ESG is over here and our business is over here. You're trying to integrate it into the in together. So I like that trend toward it being customers and as well as regulations that are driving the change in behavior. I would like to see a little more action where it's being integrated into the supplier selection process. So it's it's very interesting, you know, the, the things you have shared, you know, looking into different geographies and then different drivers related to geography. And then as well, who are the main stakeholders uh, driving the focus on ESG being outside of the organization at this stage? That means that there are a lot of opportunities actually for the companies uh, to evolve in their ESG journey. And that brings me to the next question is, uh, what are the primary uh, challenges that organizations uh, face when integrating ESG principles into their supply chain operations, according to you know the data which you got from the survey? Marissa, you want to go first again? Sure, sure. So not surprisingly, the number one obstacle or barrier they're facing is cost, both time and money from that perspective. But right behind that, is a lack of reliable data from supply chain partners and suppliers up and down the supply chain. And I think that's a critical piece that Craig was alluding to that if you, you know, I think it kind of goes back to the old garbage in garbage out saying, if the underlying data that you're using for making your decisions isn't reliable, then the decisions are questionable. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that companies are really gonna have to deal with. They need to make the investment of the time, the money, and the resources. And they also really need to figure out this data piece. Yeah, I couldn't agree more about the data piece. And in fact, um, we're doing some research right now with Harvard Business School, looking at the idea of a, a, a framework that we put together at DSCI called data trading, where companies would be able to trade strategic data with each other for their mutual benefit. And ESG is a great example of that. Um, to be able to get more reliable carbon data or more reliable working hours data. You know, like in in the human rights and the supply chain, one of the consistent problems is excessive working hours on a global basis. So if you're able to make sure you're getting reliable data on working hours or on carbon output, that helps you to be able to have more reliable reporting internally. Because now also going back to the regulations, the reporting is more and more driven by regulators. So you have to have reliable data to be able to file reports that are going to meet the criteria that regulators um, put forth. One other quick thing I wanna highlight is really a lack of employee knowledge about what Mm -hmm. they need to do was another thing, Marissa. I know that really jumped out to me. Maybe let's talk about that a little bit, because it's easy to set the strategy, but then you got people need to know what you want them to do in terms of doing it. Over over to you on that one. Yeah, that that was a huge piece of it. You're right. I think we saw something like 76 percent of employees are not really sure how to operationalize the strategy. And that's the thing that ESG has been struggling with over the last several years, which is 
companies make very public pronouncements of we'll be net zero by this year or we'll reduce our emissions by this percentage. And that's great to have the goal, but what they need to make sure they're following up with is the actionable how to accomplish that goal inside the organization. And that's where we're seeing this gap that the employees are saying they don't really understand how to operationalize that, how to turn that strategy into action. And that's where I think there's a lot of opportunity for organizations to include employees in the conversations on how to achieve it. So it's something that they're a part of, not something that happens to them that really can. And as you said, you know, if it's in line with the overall organization's bottom line goals, missions, and and so forth, then it shouldn't be as challenging to say, here's how we're going to go about doing it. And if they provide those resources that are needed, the equipment, the technology, the human investment. So this definitely brings us towards, you know, the the, the notion of half, uh, glass half full or half empty, right? And in that sense, you know, how do we see the gap, which is evidently there, uh, in a sense of uh, integration and implementation as a threat or the opportunity? And I think we are all more on the opportunity side for everything what you what you shared. And I think one thing which I see that is uh, missing there is especially if the employees are not sure about how they can come up to the strategy, then creating certain linkage to KPIs, uh, which will uh, you know, uh, reflect the ESG goals can be uh, a way forward. But rather than me talking about it, I would like to hear you know, uh, both of you about like, what are some actionable recommendations uh, you would provide to the companies looking to improve their ESG performance in the su- supply chain operations? Um, Marisa, we can start with you. Over to you, Marissa. Oh, okay. Well, I think Craig has already hit one of them, which is that not enough organizations are incorporating this as a criteria in terms of supplier selection, so that you're building it into that front end piece there to align your practices with your stated values. Um, And I think also we saw that while it's an important piece, there is a need to really make sure that the strategy doesn't get overlooked. Um, And I think what we found was like something like 20% of organizations don't have an articulated ESG strategy. They may be working to hit the regulator targets and trying to respond, but without an actual strategy, what they're going to find is that they're in the passenger seat and it's going to be handed to them from regulators and from customers And rather than end up that way, I think it's important for company leadership to really sit down and clearly articulate the vision that they're looking to achieve. And then they can cascade that down through all levels of the organization and get the employees on board and understanding how to accomplish it. Yeah, there's a couple couple things I would add, and I completely agree with what you just said. But the first one is, Let's take a look at the goal setting process itself, right? You you said something, Marissa, that really resonated with me is too often the goals are set and they're pushed out. So I think that it's really important to have cross-functional collaboration in goal setting and get the different departments involved in the goal setting to make sure that the goals are practical given their operational responsibilities and that their performance incentives are aligned with a integrating these new ESG goals. We see a lot of companies where the performance incentives are not in alignment with the new goals that are being put in place. So that's one cross-functional collaboration. The other thing that I would highlight is I think if you look at ESG, it's a really, really broad topic. So in environment, you can have carbon, you can have water consumption, power consumption, Um, use of of hazardous materials, just a host of things. On the S pillar, everything from human rights in the supply chain to DEI to data privacy is really considered by some companies an S issue. Companies need to pick where they want to really excel to achieve a competitive advantage. You can't be great at everything across the board but you should pick those areas that are really core to your business, that are aligned with your business strategy and seek those to really excel to become a competitive advantage. 
Excellent point. I really like your your inputs, and if I can try to uh, summarize, is like you know, it's it's a great opportunity for you if you are willing as an organization to focus on the right area of ESG, which resonates with the business where you are and the geography needs where you operate, and then as well deliver the value to the customers, and then cross collaborate across your uh, value chain. But this has been really super interesting insights and uh, definitely we should deep dive more into one of the next episodes. But I would like to thank you both for, first of all, uh, deep diving into this topic with your teams and sharing with us the initial findings, which we can take forward in one of the next episodes. So uh, once again, Marisa and Craig, thank you very much for being with us.